This is the Bonita Creek subdivision where six firefighters lost their lives. Five others were injured. They died trying to protect these homes. It was a battle fought largely in vain. Uh, five minutes prior to the incident that occurred with the subdivision being burned over, it was relatively calm in the area. Uh, no indication that anything was going to happen, and then with the tremendous shift in the wind, it was coming from four different directions at once, it uh, just blew up and run over everything. Word of the deaths and injuries spread rapidly among hundreds of firefighters who continue to battle this blaze. You probably have a lot of people who are nervous now about going back in there. Uh, extremely, extremely. Most of the firefighters... What happened on the Dude Fire? Did human factors contribute to the fatalities? What can these people's deaths teach us? To answer these questions, the Forest Service hosts a staff ride. This new training tool, using a proven military technique, proves to be a wildland fire learning first. walking up Walkmore, it kind of has that, that gray, dark gray look to it. I said to my crew boss of the day, we rotate our crew bosses um, into the valley of death, rode the 600. I don't know why I said that. This house is probably one of the most significant places in my entire career in, in fire, because this is where I thought I had the, the most opportunity or the most chance of dying. I was in a death race, I felt, just from the bottom of the canyon to here. The, the shelters were breaking down, and the, the shelters were being lifted up, and, and people were being burned to the point that, um, that they thought they were going to die. Why did the Dude Fire staff ride have such an important impact on the wildland fire people who experienced it? How can we carry the staff ride's valuable teachings and insights forward? Yes. How can we help prevent fatalities on all future wildland fires? That was and is the heart of the staff ride. A national interagency fire behavior workshop brought 130 fire behavior analysts to Phoenix, Arizona. The workshop's organizers knew the Dude Fire had occurred nearby. They realized questions still lingered about what really happened that day. There were still lessons this fire could teach us. But how? Dr. Glenn Robertson, professor of military history, was contacted. He wrote the Staff Ride Manual, a unique and highly successful approach for studying and learning from past military encounters. Robertson immediately saw the opportunity to apply Staff Ride principles to the wildland fire environment. He signed on to help plan the Dude Fire Staff Ride, a learning and training first. The Staff Ride has three vital parts the preliminary study, the on-site field study, and the integration phase. The first, the preliminary study, detailed information about what happened at the incident mailed to participants well in advance to ensure they come prepared. The second, the on-site field study, the actual on-the-ground visit to the incident site. The Dude Fire staff ride participants spent an entire day from sunrise to sunset moving through eight different locations known as stands arranged chronologically. At each stand the presenters spoke. They were actual Dude Fire veterans, both firefighters and overhead. They told their stories of what happened that day, then answered questions, interacted with participants, and shared information. At each stand, these leaders wove specific instructional objectives into the discussion. The result, crucial insights and learning. 
stretching columns off. The, the third staff ride stage is the all-important integration phase. This provides a forum to discuss what was learned from the first two phases. It offers an opportunity to decide how people can apply these lessons learned, how they can better determine what does all this mean to me today and tomorrow. You're about to walk back down into Walkmoor Canyon in Arizona's Tonto National Forest, the actual scene of the Dude Fire fatalities. Let's join in with the others that day in the on-site field study on the Dude Fire staff ride. We established a strategy which was at this point in time focused on Bonita Creek subdivision. And that was, this thing, as I said, I believe it was down further, it may have even been further to the west. It, we knew we were going to get some severe downslope simply because of the, the heating in the basin down toward Phoenix and the cooling up on top of the rim. And we are already by that time we're experiencing some, uh, uh, some downslope winds on the fire that early in the evening. And our strategy at this point in time is to get some dozers in here, put a line from this road here back down into to the control road, continue with this road up in this in this manner and begin a burnout here. You know, uh, there, there was a uh, fire behavior forecast that was made, but help me, uh, uh, you know, Lindsay and, and John, JP, uh, when, when we walked down on the line, we didn't have that in our hand. Now, it's not to say that it's a teen's responsibility, we wanted to get out here and, and start start uh, helping out. You know, we could hear on the radio fire was going to come in on Benita. So we knew it, it, it was hot and rocking up here. Yeah. The next stand features a fire weather overview provided by a National Weather Service meteorologist and several hotshot crew superintendents who described their actions that day the dude fire blew up. Just prior to the blow up, the fire was being transitioned from the Type 2 incident command team to a Type 1 team. The hotshot's priority was a burnout operation to protect the 58 home Bonita Creek subdivision from the approaching Dude Fire flame front. Eight hand crews worked beside and down canyon below the subdivision. Several wildland engine and structural firefighting crews were inside the subdivision. By 1500 hours, six firefighters were dead and 47 homes were completely destroyed by fire. And so what I want to do now is take you from the morning of the 26th, basically through about 2.30 in the afternoon on the 26th. And, uh, and from this spot right here, uh, the thing is uh, a significant note that you'll be looking at later on are, are the safety zone where we had how many people? Uh, 120, yeah, 40, about, about 120. And the fact we talked about the really well-developed downslope winds that spread the fire all night long. And by the morning of the 26th, and by going back and looking at it, <clears throat> we, we were estimating the fire was at about 2,000 acres. Yes? Um, plume dominated, was it considered plume dominated from 10 o'clock in the morning on, or? Yes, it was a plume dominated fire as a convection column was building. But if you- By looking at this thing, where is that fire position? Mid slope. Mid slope. So immediately you have a fire that's positioned mid-slope. We hit that cat line with a, after punching probably a half a mile of line, hit that cat trail, getting ready to do that firing operation, and we got hit with a down blast off the rim, down slopes that were probably in the neighborhood of 25 to 35 miles an hour. Fire pushed lateral and ran probably a half a, a, half a mile in about 10 or 15 minutes. At that point, we knew it was gonna be a long and exciting night. Came back in here and tied in with, tied in with the, at this point where we're standing right now, tied in with the crew that had an assignment. So, uh, there's a little, through Bonita Creek right here on top, there's a bench. They started firing, tied into the black, and started firing operation with the overall plan that I didn't find out until a couple days later, but. Was that out of the norm, did you feel, or normal for what situations you guys get into? A lot of the times, as, you, as, as a type one soup, you're gathering intelligence as you go constantly yeah, because yeah. You're, you're putting the pieces to the puzzle together as you go, and you're getting a piece here, and you're getting a piece there, and you're talking to Paul, and I'm talking to John, and we're going, what'd you see, and what'd you see, and we're, we're putting that puzzle together all the time. That, that's, so that's a pretty norm for us to do. Coming in, coming in here, not having all the pieces to the puzzle, I was still, my comfort level was still there, because that's, that's how we do business. There, the urgency of, of just what the day was going to bring wasn't quite there. I remember one of my young squad bosses saying, 
boy, if it's burning like this now, just imagine what it's going to do at one o'clock. Yeah. You know, and there is some wise wisdom in that. <laughs> you know, a couple of things. I'm usually not nervous when I have too many parts, but I was nervous about having too many parts in here that day. I was, we were all kind of bump, Paul, you remember we were all kind of, kind of bumping into each other. And I don't know, JP, if you were feeling that way too, but it was like, boy, and that was one of the reasons I was more than willing to give up the drip torch and say, hey, we'll hold this, we'll hold behind you guys, go on, we'll be glad to do that. Zigzag was uh, down the hill there a little bit further. Andy called down, he says, hey, come on up here uh, and uh, take a look at what's happening. D division was burning 20 feet, 25 feet, uh, a black line. We talked to the division soup and we got more aggressive with the burnout. Right. The, that safety zone is, uh, and the heat that was released off that was, was our, our responsibility, but we had 180 people up here and uh, just uh, that was not, uh, what we were burning was not going to make a difference if uh, things went sour and, and we all knew it was hot and, and rocky. We all know we made mistakes ourselves here. I made a mistake when I went through camp and didn't get any information, even if it wasn't there and it wasn't at the time. And I came up here, followed a division soup and uh, I wouldn't do that and I, I quit doing it after that, but uh, the fact that there was information out there and not getting the people should be a hint that then don't send them out there. Put a roadblock down at the hill and let this place go. What was the chatter amongst the crew people on the ground and stuff that, that you guys were supervising? With the, uh, the support that was here, 140 to 180 by any estimate personnel up in this subdivision protecting it, including six hotshot crews. Um, a plan in place to burn around the subdivision, fire behavior that we were in observation of, at least what we could see on the slope, was non-threatening, really. It was, um, it was actually working to our benefit if we could get this firing show around it. it yeah. I felt like there was a pretty good probability of success in at least <laughs> protecting this front of the subdivision. What we observed was very light I estimated two, three, maybe four at best, uh, upslope, up canyon winds with a backing fire. And uh, whether the burnout over, uh, that was progressing over there was affecting anything, from my, from my perspective, no, it was not. That continued right on through that, to the that continued, That continued right on through till on my, on my uh, chronology, uh, right about 1400. Instant fire. I mean, fire was, you know, 150 yards away, instant fire here, there, everywhere, and growing quickly. You know, Paul described the spot fire up there that he dealt with the hose. Um, there was no hose down here. There was just 50 mile an hour winds pushing every single spot that, that, that took, and every spot did take. We were working down towards JP at, at one point. Uh, you know, we heard that the fire got across uh, the lower uh, fire control road. We heard uh, that it was, uh, the fire was on the other side <coughs> threatening Bonita Estates and that there were shelters deployed. When the blow up hit, Type 2 Perryville crew member Jeff Hatch deployed his shelter with the others. During the flame front, however, he abandoned his shelter and tried to escape up canyon through the fire. It is estimated he endured temperatures as high as 800 degrees. Jeff was severely burned. When the hotshot superintendents found him, he had no hard hat. His hair and backpack were smoking. He was on fire. This is the approximate area where we observed uh, uh, Jeff Hatch, the injured firefighter, walking up the line, basically out of the smoke and fire. Uh, at this point, the fire is making runs through the canopy and um, really threatening any position along this line. Uh, we were able to get the EMTs down here. We felt are comfortable enough doing that, but as soon as they arrived, we knew we were in a dire position and we started moving back towards the uh, subdivision. The JP, Lindsay, uh, and myself, we're coming up the canyon and uh, we have our crew EMTs with us, a, a few of them, and we got this guy Hatch that, that uh, was, uh, when we, the three of us ran across him, he was on fire, he was burning up. There were approximately eight or nine people 
carrying the stretcher and um, you know trying to trying to secure our own safety at the same time we stopped here we knew the area had been burned by the crews ahead of us and we knew there was safety zone there but you see the green here and there was more green here where this house stood there was smoke because the fire was blowing and going we couldn't see exactly which direction to take so we stopped um, this house is probably one of the most significant places in my entire career in, in fire because this is where I thought I had the, the most opportunity or the most chance of dying. We hung out kind of in this forward area initially and uh, uh, once we were secure in getting there we took the, the injured firefighter up into the black and at that point um, I climbed that hill that you can see through the trees there and located a hella spot and called some Sawyers up from various crews to get that place opened up so we could pull them out of there. At the next stand, Dave Latour shared his experience. That day on the Dude Fire, he was crew representative for the Perryville inmate crew. They were improving the line down canyon from the hot shots when the sudden blow up entrapped Dave, Jeff Hatch, and nine other crew members. Cut off by flames from an easier down canyon escape, they tried to outrun the fire uphill, but could not. With no other alternative, they were forced inside their fire shelters. Dave was burned, but he survived. Six others around him perished. He is standing in the exact spot where he and the others deployed. We ran back up about three-tenths of a mile, back up to this point, and, uh, and the fire was coming over this ridge line at that point and was getting quite close to us. It was probably less than, uh, certainly less than a couple hundred feet from us at that point. It crested this ridge and broke into a, a large wall of flames as it came over that ridge. Uh, at that point, we knew that we only had a few, maybe a minute left or so <coughs> before the fire got to us. Uh, and so the decision was made to deploy at this point. Um, quite frankly, we didn't want to deploy here. This is not what I would consider an ideal site to deploy. Um, the, the situation really dictated that we, that we deploy here. Um, at the time that that I got into my shelter, um, I was. We were, I started talking to the people that were right next to me. I could, I could hear probably one or two people, or two to three people on each side of me, uh, but it was pretty loud even then. Uh, and and I could hear the the crew folks that were talking, and they sounded quite optimistic. Uh, they were saying things like, "Oh, we're Perryville. We're tough. Uh, we're going to make this. We're going to be okay." And they were they were trying to cheer each other up. And again, they sounded very optimistic and quite sure that, um, I, I think uh, they were quite sure that everybody was going to be okay. I think we all were. Uh, we knew that it was going to be, uh, was going to be a, a difficult situation, but I, th I think all of us thought that we were going to walk away from it. Um, when the first flame front hit us, uh, however that changed, uh, the, the force of the first flame front, uh, I would estimate that the ones were 60 to 70 miles per hour. Uh, the shelters lifted up, my shelter lifted up, and I saw uh, fire come into my shelter. Um, active flame came into my, into my shelter. Uh, a large amount of debris was blown into my shelter, burning, uh, a lot of burning debris blew into, inside the shelter and up against my body. As soon as that first wave hit us and I, and I heard uh, uh, Curtis Springfield uh, screaming that he couldn't take it, I, I, I was yelling, almost constantly through the whole event, you know, stay in your shelter, stay on the ground. And uh, and for some people, I think that, that kept them there. I know Don Love and, and some of the folks that were right next to me, but quite frankly, the sound that, that we heard was, was indescribable. Uh, it was so loud that beyond somebody screaming right next to you, you, you really couldn't hear during the time that the flame fronts were passing over. There was a, a second and a third flame front, very distinct flame fronts that hit us. There was a lull in between that lasted anywhere from a few seconds, maybe up to a minute. Uh, and then we were hit again by another distinctive flame front. And uh, again, there was three of them. And, and sometime after the first flame front, my shelter on the right side delaminated uh, from head to toe and the right side folded over onto the, onto the left side. Um, at that point, I began to, to receive 
some fairly significant burn injuries. Uh, I also took a, a lot of smoke at that point, uh, and the temperature obviously inside the shelter went up dramatically. Uh, during that time, there was there was some folks that obviously moved around, and and it was quite obvious that there was going to be some fatalities as a result of that. Um, after we were in the shelters for approximately 45 minutes, uh, the area cooled down to a point that I felt that we could uh, could get out of the shelters, uh, not fully, but we could at least get up and move around. So we decided to leave the site. Uh, I got five people up and we started walking down the canyon, the people that were able to leave at that point. Um, we began to walk down the canyon, it's about seven tenths of a mile, and uh, I believe five tenths of a mile or so down the canyon. Uh, Mr. Ellis sat down along the side of the trail and said, I'm dead, and, uh, and he did in fact die. And Hatch is never gonna be the same. I mean, he was burned over 90% of his body, and you know, he's always gonna have, he, you know, he's scarred from head to toe, and he's, his joints are never gonna work right. And he's, he's never gonna be the same. Autopsies that we got, there's several things we look at. Um, one, of course, is the burn injuries. Uh, smoke inhalation and, and death from smoke inhalation is usually a real good indicator is what they call the carboxyhemoglobin level, and that's the amount of, of carbon monoxide that you suck in that gets in your bloodstream. And if you're alive for a long time and you're sucking in a lot of smoke, your carboxyhemoglobin level will be elevated. Uh, Sandra Bachman, the woman that, that died over here, uh, did not look like she had much worse than a, a first to second degree sunburn about her head and shoulders. Uh, her hair was not singed badly. Uh, her Nomex was not damaged badly. So the heat was the thing that got these folks when they got up and moved around. And I'm sure that's what happened to Ellis, the, the person that walked out with them, was that he got up, even though the flame front might have been passed, the heat was still there. And he got up and, and just had a longer term effect before he finally went down talking to Dick about this earlier, one of the things that I think we have to stress is that it, is to tell people what to expect when they get into the shelters. Uh, if you're doing shelter training with people, they have to know that, that, that's, that they're going to experience that kind of event and they're going to have high winds, the shelters are going to blow around, they're going to, they may see and hear things outside the shelter. Uh, and I, I think the key thing is to know absolutely without a doubt that if you get out of that shelter, you're gonna die. You have to make people understand that, that the best place for them to be is to stay there and, and if they're getting burned, that they're still better off and they're probably gonna survive it as opposed to getting out of the shelter. Again, my, when my shelter delaminated and, and it folded over, um, you know, I made, I made a real effort to keep my face away from that side. I turned away from that and, and had my, my arms around my face and, and kept my face as low to the ground. Uh, I didn't have any uh, any heat related uh, respiratory injuries, and and I'm I'm sure that it was because I stayed with my face close to the ground. Dick, this you know the crew finally had to take a stand here. This looks like the worst possible place yeah. to even think about setting yeah. up a fire shelter. I mean, in this little depression and yeah. surrounded by fuel, that I just can't hardly imagine it. And I appreciate your comment on. The survivability of, of this kind of a, a place where the fuels are so close to people. Sandra Bachman, a corrections officer with the Perryville inmate crew, served as one of the crew's squad bosses. This was her very first fire. It would be her last. As the wall of flames first hit them, with only vital seconds to spare, Sandra had trouble opening her shelter. Inmate James Denny stopped to help her before trying to get into his own shelter. Um, this was her very first fire. Uh, I remember very clearly her telling me that as we were driving in, that uh, this was her first fire and she was looking at it and she was, uh, she was uh, apprehensive. Uh, she did have some problems getting into her shelter. Uh, James Denny, who was one of the squad bosses on that crew, um, assisted her as, as you'd expect a squad boss to do. I mean, he was doing a good job. He had somebody that was new and he turned around and helped her get into her shelter. The staff ride continued on that day. 
And after the last stand and during the integration phase, participants unanimously agreed that they would take the lessons they learned back to their home units, that they would carry and share Dude Fire staff ride insights for the rest of their fire careers, for the rest of their lives. A national critique team assigned to the staff ride to measure its success as a training tool was also 100% convinced of its value. it was certainly going to be a, an excellent uh, view of not only the, the fire environment setting, but uh, an excellent way to get a feel for all the things that took place, the decisions that were made, and get you just about as close to real world immersion in this as you could get. I came out just because my whole emphasis and experience is in research, and I want my research to be very applicable to people on the field, and this was my... Uh, ground touch trip, you know, to remind myself as to what we we're really doing in research. And yes, it was for myself, but also I think to better direct, you know, the research that I'm going to carry on. I was not disappointed. It was really an excellent um, uh, experience all day long and an opportunity to learn everything from the fire behavior aspects of it to the decision making that went on and so on. And of course, it's a very sobering thing. And, and I I think this is a really exceptional tool. I, I think that it should be continued. Um, whoever does it is going to get a lot of value out of it. And, and I already have ideas of how to use some of the information here to kind of bring life to this discussion of the kind of phenomenon that took place in, in terms of the downburst. So uh, it carries an implication for me as a trainer to, to uh, ways to uh, bring a much more high impact and realistic description to the classroom as well. Yes, the Dude Fire staff ride was the first, but it won't be the last. More staff rides for other wildland fire events are now in the planning stages. The staff ride concept can also apply to other types of fire events, including near miss fires, fire successes, and even wildland fire use. Of course, as with the Dude Fire, the staff ride is also a vital tool for learning from fatality wildfires. That's the true heart of a wildfire staff ride. How can we learn to do our business better and more safely? And how can we prevent life-threatening situations in the future? For, as we now realize, to truly learn, we must go back and walk where our fellow firefighters have fallen.